It is now my truly great pleasure to introduce today's commencement speaker, Congressman Steny Hoyer. Congressman Hoyer is not only a towering figure in Congress with 33 years of dis distinguished service, he served longer than any member of Congress in Maryland's history. We're also proud that he's one of our own. He's a graduate with high honors from the University of Maryland, and we're sitting here today in the very heart of his congressional district. The university and the School of Public Policy have never had a better friend than Congressman Hoyer. For years, he supported the Steny and Judy Hoyer Fellowship in the school, which has provided generous support to students as they've connected with the center of the nation's and the world's government, which is just, of course, eight miles away. He's also led the effort to support the Gladys Noon Spellman Fellowship, named in honor of the distinguished member of Congress who preceded him into office. Representative Hoyer has always made a very special place in his exceptionally busy schedule to meet with our Hoyer and Spellman Fellows. Part of the welcome always includes his description of a very Maryland scene with huge implications for the nation and for the world. Washington's resignation of his commission as commander of the Revolutionary Armies. The time was 1783. The place was the Maryland State House in Annapolis. And the lesson Representative Hoyer points out as he points to the portrait of this ceremony on the wall of his office is the greatness and wonder of American democracy. Because this was the, perhaps the first time in the history of the world that a victorious general ever laid down his sword in support of a fledgling elected democracy. As minority whip in the House, there might have been times when he might very well have wished for Washington's sword. But his great strength has always been his experience, his know-how, and a collegial manner that's made it uniquely possible for him to reach across the aisle to get things done. As whip for the Democrats in the House, he's in charge of rounding up votes, which makes it the fact that he's sometimes the person that two-time Academy Award winner Kevin Spacey has looked to in preparing for his role in the Netflix mega-hit House of Cards. But Spacey told reporters that he had it easy compared to the real job of the real whip in the real house on the very tough real issues. Representative Hoyer has led the charge in bringing health care to low-income children. He has brought new opportunities to disabled Americans. He has been a champion of human rights and has fought against genocide throughout the world. And he's worked tirelessly to improve the operation of the House of Representatives itself, a thankless job on which he's nevertheless made big progress. Uh, you may not know this, but he's even a knight, a special honor bestowed by the government of Denmark in the Order of Danabrog. Representative Hoyer is a leader of uncommon principle at a time in Washington when that has been an all too short a supply. He's been a wonderful friend of the state, to the University of Maryland, and most of all, to our own School of Public Policy. So it gives me the greatest privilege now to introduce and welcome him as our commencement speaker today, Representative Steny Hoyer. Good, good morning. I hope it's not good afternoon when I finish. <laughs> that allusion to Kevin Spacey always worries me. <laughs> Kevin Spacey, of course, uses the sword on a regular basis, as you who have watched that program notice. Uh, Dean Kettle, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Alan Schick, uh, one of the giants uh, as it relates to budgetary policy. Alan has, and I had the opportunity to work together when I first went to the Congress of the United States. There are 534 of my colleagues who need to enroll in your class, Alan. <laughs> I count myself as the 535th. Caleb Wolf, thank you for introducing me to this 
awesome group of people who sit before me as graduates of the School of Public Policy. Ambassador Schwab, it's always good to be with you, uh, with whom I have the opportunity to work so closely on so many different very important efforts for our country. Secretary Gansler, uh, thank you for your service to our country. Secretary Gansler uh, at the Department of Defense and I work together uh, on a frequent basis. His contributions to the country are extraordinary and very appreciated. President Glickman, who addressed uh, the class, he's a recruiter and a fundraiser, as you could tell, ladies and gentlemen, of the class of 2014. He is your former SGA president here at College Park and now head of the Pol Public Policy Alumni Board. Uh, Bo Kemper and I had an opportunity to talk before uh, we came out here uh, with the Robertson Foundation. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you for the Robertson Foundation's focus on encouraging people to come into public service, although I observed to him that the neither the House nor the Senate are doing much to encourage people to come into public service right now. And the crowd said, Amen, silently. <laughs> Thank you to the grandparents, to the parents, the siblings, the friends who are here, who helped our graduates reach this day. Christina, congratulations to you for your extraordinary accomplishment as the leader of these 176 graduates academically. And thank you as well to the faculty, to the staff, the administration, the School of Public Policy for everything you've done as mentors, advisors, to prepare the class of 2014 for whatever comes next. Let me also extend my congratulations to graduates Martin Fitzgerald and Sarah Gallagher, who I had the opportunity to meet just a little while ago, who are recipients of the fellowship my late wife Judy and I established to promote the study of public policy. And I also want to congratulate Christina England, Lindsay Dodd, and Rachel Kane, who are this year's Gladys Noon Spellman Fellows. I had the honor of succeeding that extraordinary woman to the Congress of the United States when she fell ill. And I joined with her family in 1985 to launch the fellowship uh, that her name uh, is on for the Fellowship of the School of Public Policy. Graduates, the year I graduated from law school in 1966, Senator Robert F. Kennedy delivered a powerful address while visiting the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And he said this, like it or not, we live in times of danger and uncertainty. And he went on to say that all of us will ultimately be judged, and as the years pass, we will surely judge ourselves on the effort that we have contributed to building a better society and the extent to which our goals and ideals shaped that effort. He went on to say that our future may lie beyond our vision, but it is not completely beyond our control. Indeed, he said, it is the shaping impulse of America that neither fate, nor time, nor the irresistible tides of history, but the work of our own hands, matched to reason and principle that will determine our destiny. Senator Kennedy's words are true today as they were then. Like it or not, graduates of 2014, we live in times of danger and uncertainty, but the future surely is not beyond our control. When Senator Kennedy spoke in 1966, the security of our world rested in the hands of two superpowers, ourselves and the Soviets, the balance between them providing, ironically, a measure of stability. In 2014, it's not one main adversary that we face, but a host of non-state actors and regional powers vying for, the, for advantage in power and in resources. In 1966, our gross federal debt was $328 billion. Today, it is over $17 trillion. When I graduated, the federal minimum wage was 
$1.25. In 2014 dollars, that was $10.77 or about 40% higher than it actually is today. And there's a growing skepticism among many Americans that the opportunities that enabled you to access higher education will no longer be there for the next generation. In 1966, information traveled around the world in a matter of hours or days as newspapers went to print and television was broadcast. Today, as you know, Within a split second, a single tweet can launch a conversation spanning the globe just as easily as it can launch an uprising or spark a sectarian violence. The world you're entering as newly minted graduates is a far more complex one than when I sat in your seats or stood in your shoes. However, I think I can say with certainty that you are prepared for it. The education you received here at the School of Public Policy is rooted in its mission to, and I quote, prepare broadly knowledgeable and innovative leaders to have an impact on the profound challenges of the 21st century. Our challenges are, in fact, profound. But you have the tools to provide positive, effective responses. As Kennedy said in this, it is the work of our own hands. What you will do with your Maryland education, matched to reason and principle, that will determine the destiny of yourselves, of your families, of your communities, of your state, of your nation, and because we live in America, indeed of all the world. Reason and principle in today's public discourse is in too short a supply. The challenges of the 21st century will require those who engage in policy making not only to be good leaders, but good listeners as well. Let me suggest to you that the incitement of confrontation takes no talent. The creation of consensus, on the other hand, is a critical ability in a successful democracy. The challenges of the 21st century will require those who engage in policy making not only to be good leaders and not only to be good listeners, but also to be good and determined to create agreement, consensus, action. Not simply to care about issues, but to address them carefully and acknowledge their complexities. Sadly, too much of our politics of late has been characterized by simplicity, sound bites rather than sound arguments, and impulse without regard to implications. However, as I look out on all of you and think about the promise of your generation, I see much cause for the hope that reason and principle will continue to serve as your guide. When I wore the cap and gown in 1966, there were only three women in my law school class at Georgetown Law. It's now, of course, over 50% women. Fortunately, this has changed, and I've had the privilege of serving alongside pioneering women like Barbara Mikulski, Hillary Rodden Clinton, Nancy Pelosi, and yes, Ambassador Schwab, who continue to inspire a new generation of public service. When I began law school, segregation and discrimination continued to deny equal access and equal opportunity to millions of Americans. Jazz Lewis is here, young African American, who's now on my staff. I congratulate him on his graduation. I entered public service in large part because of the civil rights movement. I went to school in the late 50s uh, in high school and the early 60s in college and law school. The civil rights movement was the movement of my time. Today, while much work remains to make our union more perfect, the moral arc of the universe, as Dr. King observed, has bent in justice's direction. 
But graduates, you know too well, it is not there yet. The quest for justice remains ongoing, and it is for your generation to continue to strive toward a more perfect union and a more perfect world. The growing diversity among our policymakers in both background and in beliefs makes America stronger as we face new challenges. However, we must make certain that our diversity will not be the genesis of our division. One nation, indivisible. Yes, with different opinions, with different views, with different solutions, but one nation, creation of consensus in a democracy, a critical talent and objective for us all. I have confidence that you and your peers can meet those challenges. What you learned here at the School of Public Policy was not just a wealth of knowledge and theories, but an understanding of your ability to reason and determine your own set of principles and how to channel that knowledge, that reason, and those principles into making a difference. You've already shown us how. Each year, School of Public Policy students participate in the Do Good Challenge. What a wonderful challenge. Was that Sarah who, where participants team up to make the greatest possible social impact through innovative philanthropy. One of this year's two winning teams created a social networking site for LGBT youth to connect with pen, pen pals for peer-to-peer -peer support. How critical it is when we're under assault or we're perceived to be different that we have peer-to-peer -peer support. The other launched an organization to build schools in Honduras. Finalists included a team working to connect the Anacostia River Bike Trail to an urban farm and another linking college-age mentors with at-risk students in Prince George's County. The work of our own hands matched to reason and principle. Your generation, the most interconnected in human history, has the advantage of seeing more of the world up close than any generation that preceded you. But as our world shrinks, your responsibility to do good in it grows. Even now, as was the case in the last century and for centuries before that, the awareness of injustice or suffering too often did not, does not lead to action. In the 21st century, however, one cannot plead ignorance of injustice or suffering on the other side of the room or indeed on the other side of the world. So I urge you, in each of your own lives, to commit a philanthropy of time, energy, intellect, knowledge, and effort to meet the challenges you discover. And with the world at your fingertips, you'll surely find a way. An education demands responsibility. So proceed from here with pride in having attained knowledge but also humbled, recognizing what possession of that knowledge entails. As the years pass, and to paraphrase Kennedy, you surely judge yourselves, as each of us do. Let your yardstick be the degree to which you were guided by reason and principle, and by how well you employed them to do good wherever possible. Sometimes you'll be daunted by the task before you. But I will leave you with the same direction my commencement speaker gave when I was in the class of 1963 here at College Park. Lyndon Johnson, still Vice President, eight months from the assassination of John Kennedy, stood before us and quoted from Shakespeare who wrote, our doubts are traitors and make us lose the good we oft win by fearing to attempt. Caleb said, let's change the world. Do not fear to attempt. Challenge yourselves to do good. 
and challenge others to do the same. In doing so, you will surely judge yourselves successful. Congratulations and Godspeed. Congressman Hoyer, thank you so much for those words of inspiration for the call to justice and especially for the way that you model that in your work and in your career and all that you do on behalf of us in the country and those of us who are lucky enough to live in your district. Uh, it is my great pleasure here as a small token of our esteem to share a, sp a special token for the University of Maryland. Congressman Hoyer, thank you. Go Turks! Yeah.